Hi, so this is the IGCSC WAVES topic sheet, and I will be going through all the solutions for the questions. The first question states on figure 8.1, it shows the security and waiting areas at an airport. Question A states figure 8.1 shows several situations in which regions of the electromagnetic spectrum are being used. Table 8.1 gives three of these situations. State the name of the region of the EM spectrum which is being used in each situation. So for this, you should have memorized before the exam the uses for each of the EM spectrum waves. Um, for the girl listening to the radio, it's radio waves. For the boy using mobile phone, it's microwaves. And for the security guard checking bags, it can be x-rays or visible light rays. Part B states all waves can be reflected, refracted, and diffracted. State two other properties of waves in the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, the first one is that they can all travel through a vacuum. The second one is that they are transverse. And you could also say as another uh, similarity between all EM waves is that they travel at the same speed, which is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second for IGCSC purposes. Part C states, state two safety precautions for working with sources that emit gamma radiation. The first one is to limit exposure time. The second one is to perhaps in case um, the objects with gamma radi radiation in a lead shield or to use tongs slash maintain a distance from the gamma radiation source. Now onto the next page. The second question states two students, A and B, determine the speed of sound. They are standing side by side at a distance of 520 meters from a wall as shown in figure 7.1. Student A makes a loud sound by banging two blocks of wood together once. A short time later, both students hear the sound reflected from the wall. State the term for the reflected sound. Uh, this is simply an echo. Part II states, Table 7.1 lists properties of a sound wave. Compare the properties of the original sound and the reflected sound. For each property, place a tick in one column. Uh, so the properties that will stay the same are the speed, wavelength, frequency, and the fact that it's a longitudinal wave and the characteristics that will change between the original sound wave and the echo is the loudness and amplitude. This is because when reflected, energy is lost due to absorption by the wall plus scattering uh, and less energy means particles don't move as far apart. So the amplitude um, reduces because the amplitude is simply the max distance particles in a medium move from rest position as a wave passes. Um, and we all know that amplitude is what determines the loudness of a sound wave. So when amplitude decreases, so does the loudness. Part B, part I, states student B measures the time between the original sound and the reflected sound. Suggest a suitable device for measuring the time interval between hearing the original sound and hearing the reflected sound. This would be a stopwatch. And part II states the time interval between hearing the original sound and hearing the reflected sound is 3.1 seconds. Use information shown in figure 7.1 to calculate the speed of sound. Um, and so we know that uh, the distance the sound is traveling is 520 meters and it's going back and then forth. So that, that's the reflected sound wave. So that's 520 times two, which gives you 1,040 meters, which is the distance it covers. Um, and we know that speed equals distance over time. They've given us the time it took to travel, 3.1 seconds. So that's 1,040 over 3.1, and that should get you around this answer. Um, for the next question, part A, part I states, figure 6.1 shows crests of a plane of a plane water wave approaching a barrier with a gap. On figure 6.1, draw three crests of the water wave to the right of the barrier. Um, so 
This is known as diffraction, as you would have studied in the syllabus. Um, and since the gap is smaller than the wavelength, this is why diffraction occurs and the light curves. And actually, one more correction I should make is that these shouldn't technically shouldn't be touching the barrier because the light is moving this way. So technically speaking, none of the light should be able to come at a perfect 90 degrees to the barrier. Part II states figure 6.2 shows crests of a plain water wave in deep water approaching a region of shallow water. The water moves slow, more slowly in shallow water. Um, on figure 6.2, draw three crests of the water wave in the shallow water. And part two states the direction of travel of the wave in the shallow water. So they tell us it moves more slowly in shallow water. If you want to know the reason for this, um, it's basically because in shallow water, more of the water particles interact with the bottom of the uh, container or whatever is at the bottom. And so that friction slows down the water. Um, and since they're telling us it moves more slowly, we know that this means it bends towards the normal. So if we draw the normal at this point, which is this line, this is the normal, um, we know that the line is coming in at this angle by this much, which would be around maybe this much on the other end. So we've put a smaller angle to show that it's bending towards the normal. And then you draw your waves and you have to put down the direction of travel as per the second question, which is what this is. Part B states, state two way in which transverse waves differ from longitudinal waves. Uh, transverse, transverse waves cause particles in medium to move perpendicular to the direction of motion, whereas particles in longitudinal waves move parallel to direction of motion. Um, and the second thing is that transverse waves have troughs uh, and crests, and longitudinal waves have compressions and rare refractions. Part C, part I, says state a typical value of the speed of sound in water. Uh, you can give any value between 1,000 to 2,000 meters per second, and you should have me memorized this before your exam. Um, part II says, explain why sound travels faster in water than in air. This is because molecules are closer together in water since it's more dense, so they can pass on energy and they uh, vibrate next to each other. The next question uh, says, Two students, A and B, use echoes to measure the speed of sound. Student A has two blocks of wood that make a loud sound when banged together. Student B has a stopwatch. They stand 120 meters from a school wall as shown in figure 6.2. Describe how the students use the arrangement in figure 6.2 to, to determine the speed of sound in air. Uh, well, the first thing is that student A bangs two blocks of woods uh, of wood. The second mark is that student B starts the stopwatch when the blocks collide, and then student B stops the stopwatch when she hears the echo, and then repeat this and calculate average time. Uh, and you use 240 meters, which is 120 times two, since the sound is going there and back, as the distance traveled and the speed is distance over time. So you would do 240 over whatever time recorded to get the speed of the sound wave. Um, the next question says, describe an experiment to determine the speed of sound in air. State the apparatus you need, details of how to take measurements, and how to calculate the speed of sound in air. You may use the, speed below, the space below to draw a label diagram as part of your answer. Um, generally, for any method questions that are five or more marks, you want to make sure you're including the method of your, experience, of your experiment, the apparatus, what measurements you will be taking, um, what calculations you will be taking, and I would generally recommend that you also include that you'll be repeating 
the experiment five times and taking an average. For this particular question, that doesn't get you a mark, but it's still good practice to do it because in many other questions, it does give you a mark. So in this case, the method I'm using is uh, using a clap and the echo method. The apparatus I would use for this is a stopwatch, wall, and meter rule. The measurement I would be taking is to measure the distance between the person and the wall, and the second measurement is to start the stopwatch when the person claps and stop it when the echo is heard. Uh, as for calculations, we know that speed is two times distance from student clapping the wall, cl from student clapping to wall, uh, divided by the time for the echo. Part B states sound waves from a television are diffracted through doorways. Light waves from a television are not diffracted through doorways. Suggest why light waves and sound waves be behave differently in this situation. So I said that the wavelength of light is smaller than the width of the doorway, and that the wavelength of the sound wave is larger than the width of the doorway. So diffraction occurs for the sound wave um, and not necessarily for the light wave. However, you could say this differently. You could just say that the, um, oh yeah, they tell you that the light is not diffracted. So that has to be the answer. For the next question, uh, it states the focal length of the lens is 3 cm. Part A says rays of light parallel to x, y are traveling towards the lens. Describe what happens to the light after it passes through the lens. Uh, well, they tell us that this is a converging lens, so we know that all light meets a one point called the focal point, and it then diverges from the focal point. This is kind of what it looks like. This is the converging lens, the light entering, it converges, and then it looks like it diverges because all of the light rays continue on their paths. Part B says, on figure 7.1, mark and label with an F each of the two principal focuses on the lens. Um, and they tell us that the focal length of the lens is 3 cm, so the principal focuses are 3 cm, according to the units they've given us here, away from the y-axis. Part C states, the small nail n of height 1.2 cm is positioned 2 cm to the left of the lens. Uh, part I says, by drawing on figure 7.1, find the position of the image I of n and add image I to the diagram. Um, so you should have learned how to do diagrams through converging and diverging lenses um, behind the focal point, in front of the focal point, and on the focal point. So in this case, we're drawing a, an image of an object that is in front of the focal point and it's going through a converging lens. So how you do that is you draw from the top of an image a line going through the origin and continuing down. And then from the top of the image parallel to the x-axis, you draw a line that meets the y-axis. And then from there, go draw a line that passes through the focal point and continues going down. Then you would come back and from this line, you would draw a line in the opposite direction as a continuation of that line. And you would do the same thing for the line that goes through the origin. And where those two lines is the meet is the top of the image of the object. As I've drawn here, this is image I. Uh, part II states, state and explain whether I is a real or virtual image. It is a virtual image since it is formed where the virtual rays meet, not where the real rays meet. State the name given to a lens when it is used in this way. It is a magnifying glass. The next question, uh, part A states, a student shines a ray of red light towards a large glass prism as shown in figure 5.1. The angles of the prism are 45 degrees, 90 degrees, and 45 degrees. The critical angle for the glass is 42 degrees. Um, on figure 5.1, part I states, continue the path of the ray in the glass prism to a boundary between glass and air. So as it enters, they tell us that it's already 90 degrees to the surface, which means it's on the normal line because the normal line is also 90 degrees to the surface which means that 
the angle of refraction is zero, so it continues as a straight line until it reaches this edge. Then they state, draw and label the normal at the point your ray hits the boundary between glass and ray, uh, between glass and air. So at this point, the normal is 90 degrees to this surface. So there you go. Part III states, continue your ray until it emerges into air. So for this, you need to do two things. Um, we, you measure and using um, whatever angle measuring device, um, such as a compass um, that you use. Uh, I measured 45 degrees over here. Um, so total internal refraction occurs because the critical angle is 42 degrees. So it reflects back in by 45 degrees and it bounces onto over here. And then from here, we do the same thing. We figure out that it's 45 degrees, which is greater than 42 degrees, which is the critical angle. So total internal reflection occurs again, the angle for reflection being 45 degrees. So again, reflect it by 45 degrees and it should go out here. And as the line comes out here, we notice that it's already 90 degrees um, to the surface. So it's on the normal again, so it just continues on its path out into the air. For part B, it states the spectrum of visible light is made up of seven colors. Figure 5.2 shows a partially completed spectrum for visible light. On figure 5.2, write the names of the missing colors. Um, essentially, you need to say that the color between red and yellow is orange, and the color between green and indigo is blue. And then for part II, it says state the property of visible light that increases in the direction of the arrow in figure 5.2, and it is the wavelength that increases this way. For the next question, part A says state what is meant by monochromatic, that is light of a single frequency. Part B says the red light from the laser hits the curved surface of a semicircular transparent plastic block at point P and passes into the plastic. The red light travels through the plastic and hits the straight edge of the block at its midpoint M. Figure 6.1 shows that some of the light is reflected and that some of the light travels in the air along the straight edge of the plastic block. The speed of light in air is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Part I says explain why the red light does not change direction as it enters the plastic bo blocks. That's because this is the red light entering and as we notice, uh, it's any ray of light entering is always going to be perpendicular to the tangent, which means it's always going to be the normal, so the angle of ref refraction is always going to be zero, so it's just going to continue on its same straight path into the uh, semicircular transparent plastic block. Um, Part II says, at M, the angle between the red light and the plastic and the normal is 37 degrees. Calculate the speed of the red light and the plastic. So we know, now we need to bring in some of the equations that we know. Um, we know that refractive index is equal to speed of light in a vacuum over speed of light in the substance. And the speed of light in the substance is what we're trying to find. In this case, the substance is plastic. Uh, we don't know what the refractive index is, but we do know what the speed of light in a vacuum is. It's the speed of any EM wave, which is 3 times 10 to the power of 8. Now we know the other equation to find the refractive end index, which is 1 over sine c, where c is the critical angle. So that's 1 over sine 37, and we know that 37 degrees is the critical angle because some of the light rays being reflected um, right at the boundary, 90 degrees to the normal. So we get that the refractive index is equal to 1.662. So that means 1.662 is equal to 3 times 10 to the power of 8 over the speed of light in plastic. And that if you solve for the speed of light in plastic, you will get 1.8 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. For part III, it says in the plastic, blue, blue light travels slightly slower than red light, and so the critical angle for blue light is smaller than the critical angle for red light. 
the laser that emits red light is replaced by one that emits blue light. Now blue light enters the block at P and hits the straight edge at M. So it enters the block at P and hits the straight edge at M. Explain what happens to the blue light after it hits the straight edge at M. So we know that, that the critical angle for blue light is less than 37 degrees, um, since it says blue light is, the critical angle for blue light is smaller than the critical angle for red light. And we know that the angle of incidence of blue light is greater than its critical angle since the entering ray of light is 37 degrees to the normal, which is greater than the critical angle of blue light. And so we know that total internal refraction, refraction occurs. Reflection, sorry. Uh, the next question, part C, says figure 7.2 shows a ray of light traveling within an optical fiber. Part I says complete the path of the ray of light to the left-hand end of the fiber, uh, which is what I've done here. Essentially, just total internal reflection occurring inside the optical fiber. And part I, I says name the process taking place at X, and that is total internal reflection. The next question, uh, part B says, explain the term total internal reflection and it's three marks. So you first need to say bright light traveling from an optically dense medium to an optically less dense medium. Then the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle and hence all light is reflected. The next question says, state and explain the use of optical fibers in medicine. Uh, and it's three marks again. Uh, so the fiber is passed down slash delivered to the area to be examined slash treated. For example, it can reach the stomach via the esophagus. Um, for the second mark, you should say that light passes down the fiber to the site and an image returns to the sensor slash observer. So that's essentially whoever is the doctor. And for the third mark, you should give some kind of extra detail, such as mentioning the fact that it is a laser light source that could be providing light for the optical fiber, um, or what type of sensor is being used. Okay, now for the next question, it says state two reasons, to, two uses for infrared radiations. Again, you should have memorized all the uses for the different EM waves before your exam. And for infrared radiation, it would be remote controls, and infrared sensors slash alarms. Part B says x-rays are used in hospitals to help treat patients. Suggest and explain three precautions for the safe use of x-rays. The first one is to limit the time of exposure. The second one is to shielding of operation of operator slash, slash patient with lead. And the third one is to create some kind of distance from the source to reduce intensity. Um, part C, part I says state the speed in a vacuum of one microwaves, which is three times 10 to the power of eight meters per second, and two x-rays, which is also three times 10 to the power of eight meters per second because they're both EM waves and they travel at the same speed in a vacuum. Part I, I says state a possible frequency for an ultrasound wave and essentially it's anything above 20,000 hertz. Again, you should have memorized this before your exam. The next question says, describe and explain the action of optical fibers in communications technology. You may draw a diagram in your answer. I've not drawn a diagram, but what you can say to get three marks is that light slash infrared waves travel in the fiber. Uh, total internal reflection occurs in the inner surfaces of the fiber and the light carries information slash signals slash data. And yes, that is the entire solution for the WAVES topic sheet. Thank you.